Ugh, accounting can be fun. Yes, I'm Mark Dolfini, landlord coach. I hope you're having an awesome day. Yes, accounting can actually be really fun and really exciting, but here's the thing. Many of you are just, you're, you're freaked out about it and you don't really know what it is that you're looking at. And I wanted to help dispel some of that stuff. It's just simple, basic math. And I want to walk you through that right now. Okay. So one of the, uh, the, the, the main people that I, I watch all the time is uh, Marcus Lamonis of the prophet. And, um, uh, I just felt that some of the things that he talks about a, lo a lot in his show is how he looks at the revenue numbers and why the, um, why the accountant, why the books are so important. He says that if you don't have accounting, you don't have a business. And I tend to 100% agree. It, it separates the pros from the amateurs. And, and for those people who are doing real estate full-time to those people who are just doing it as a side hustle. So here's the thing. Accounting does not need to be scary. It doesn't need to be complicated. And that's what I want to dispel for you right now. So I want to talk to you very quickly about something called an income statement or a P and L or basically p is also profit and loss. It's basically all the same thing. It's all basically tracking revenues, money coming in, and expenses, money going out. And that's all it is. So if you look here on this, on this screen, you're going to look here at your revenues. And again, I just kind of broke out these categories and it's just some you know general basic things that you might see for a rental property. Um, I would rather you break things out in terms of revenues rather than lump it all together. Meaning, you know, if you get rents and late fees and application fees, and you just kind of all throw it into one account. I would rather know where that money is coming in. I would always break it out. You know, when in doubt, break it out. I always like to uh, to know what the individual line items are rather than not. And generally, my accountant does too. Um, the reason being is because back when I was first doing this, I just got started and I didn't realize how much rent revenue was coming in versus how much late fee revenue was coming in. And my late fee revenue was substantial. And I didn't realize how much even money I was leaving on the table by not consistently charging late fees. So that's something that we definitely want to make sure that you're tracking and you are keeping an eye on. Okay. So, um, what I want to do, uh, you can do an income statement or a P and L for basically any period of time. Generally it's done either done on an annual or a, basically a monthly, um, quarterly or annual basis. We're going to do this basically on a monthly basis. So we're just going to pretend that this is what we had coming in for, uh, last month. Now I'm going to add something in here real fast. I'm seeing that there's a I don't know why it didn't save, but all right, we're going to put in a column right there. Okay. So this is everything that we've got right here. So if you look at the income statement that's coming in, so you've got rents and we're going to say that we've got a thousand dollars in rents that came in for last month. We had $50 in late fees. We didn't have any application fees because the property, we have one property. It's already been rented. Um, we do have uh, pet fees coming in of $50 a month. Um, there is no coin operated laundry. This is a single family dwelling, but you know what? We do rent them their washer and dryer for $50 a month. There's no storage fees and then utility fees. That might be a, a fee that you would charge somebody if they left the utilities in your name and, and continued to live there at the property. Or for some reason, the property, um, the, the utilities kick back into your name. Um, what Sometimes that happens for non-payment. But what I would suggest is do not offer that as a service where you're doing this, where you're paying their utilities. Um, generally, it's been my experience that if the, if the utilities wind up in your name, it's not much longer that they start having trouble paying the rents as well. So I do make the utility fees quite stiff and we'll just say that's an extra hundred bucks. All right. So taxes, what I'm talking about here, when we go into the expense side, this is all the money that's going out. Um, so our taxes, our tax bill, let's say, uh, for, is a hundred dollars a month. Keep in mind, if you were underwriting this property, meaning this is a property that you didn't currently live in, but you were thinking about buying it and you're going through this income statement analysis, this cash flow analysis, if it was a property that you didn't uh, that was not currently a rental property, but was owner occupied, the amount of the tax bill will be different if someone's living in it versus that's owns it versus someone who's living in it. That's renting it. Okay. So just make sure that you understand that before you hang your hat on a tax calculation, because the differences can be sub substantial. Uh, the amount of the insurance, I'm actually paying $50 a month. And this is something, again, you can, you can, uh, get the actual number, uh, from the person or from the company that's providing you your insurance. Um, water bill, again, we uh, let's just say for argument's sake that uh, they did put all the water, sewer, trash, electric, and gas in their name. If I was underwriting this property, though, I would still make an allocation for this, even if the residents are responsible for 
their utilities in their own name. And the reason being is because you need to budget for expected periods of vacancy. And expected periods of vacancy, you're going to have to cover the utilities in, in your name. It, even if they're minimal, you're still going to have to pay for water, you're still going to have to pay for electric, and you're still going to have to pay for you know lawn care, right? So let's just pretend in this case that there was no utilities in this in this particular instance, um, uh, but they did neglect to take care of the lawn. So we'll say that the lawn was 125 bucks um, because it got like waist high, and that's when I would charge the utility fee of 100 bucks. We can call it, we can call it that. All right. So. What in this particular case, I would go back up here and say HOA dues. The HOA dues, let's say there's no homeowners association or condo association that you have to pay for. Um, if you know, if, if they were, um, uh, you know, responsible for that. So sometimes what will happen is if there is a, a, a homeowners association, if the lawn doesn't get mowed, they'll mow it and then they'll charge you. And that's when that's why I say it would be appropriate for there to be a utility fee or some sort of ancillary fee that needs to get charged because you have to take care of this bill that came to you. All right. That's why I say I just stuck that on lawn care. Um, OK, so snow removal. Let's say it's in the middle of July. There's no snow except, of course, you people up in Wisconsin. Um, vacancy expense. This isn't an, an expense that you would normally expect to see on an income statement, except maybe if you were doing a cash flow pro forma or, or analysis on a property that you would want to buy. Now, let's talk about this real fast. A vac in vacancy expense, <clears throat> what uh, many people will do is they'll say, well, you know, my vacancy is about 10%. It, it, they, and with really no understanding of what that number even represents. If you're thinking, okay, so it's going to be 10% of a year that my property is going to be vacant, okay? That means my property is going to be vacant 1.2 months out of the year, which would be a little over five weeks. So if you're thinking, okay, my property is going to be vacated the last day of the month and I'm not going to have it rented, re-rented uh, or ready and re-rented to someone else generating revenue for another five-ish weeks, then that 10% might be, you know, might be appropriate. Here, um, in my market, you know, it's renting single family dwellings. Usually we have people move, sometimes moving out the back door while someone else is moving in the front door and we're trying to paint and clean in between. Um, you know, 10% would be really a really long period of time. Um, but apartments may, may be longer, right? That's just the nature of apartments, but single family dwellings do tend to rent much, much faster. So maybe 5% would be a, a normal vacancy expense there. But I just want you to make sure that you know what you're putting down and that it's actually representative of, of, of what actually happened. Advertising would be again, if the property was vacant, but sometimes you may just want to run a continual ad, or if you have expected vacancy coming up and you want to get ahead of it and you want to run advertising, that advertising expense would go there. Um, a leasing expense, that would be something where you are um, paying someone else possibly to show the property and uh, and then pay that, that leasing fee as an amount uh, for getting the property leased up, you know, paying, basically paying for a signed lease. So if someone gets a signed lease, I would have to pay, say, you know, half a month's rent or whatever you could negotiate uh, for getting the signed lease for, the, for a leasing fee. Lots of property management companies do charge a lease up fee. Uh, so you may want to also calculate that in the amount of the property management fee. Um, the property management will say it's 10%, but again, if you're paying yourself, that's fine, but understand that, that that is also an amount that you should allocate towards property management if you're going to be doing the underwriting of the property. In this case, you're managing the property yourself, so there's no there's nothing there. Repairs, let's say we did have $125 worth of repairs that we had to do last month. Say it was, you know, it was a small plumbing fix that we had to do. Um, and then we've got the um, mortgage payment, and this is going to be principal and interest only. And the reason why I would want the principal and interest only there is because um, we've already calculated the taxes and insurance up top, right? Um, and in that particular case, you know, we'll say that the, um, uh, you know, the, the total amount of the, uh, the principal and interest only is, uh, say $675 a month. Um, and CapEx. So this is where generally most people run into problems and they generally do not budget near enough for capital expenditure expenditure on the property. Um, CapEx are the things like, you know, the big ticket items that you're going to have to pay for. So like a new driveway, a new roof, a new, um, uh, a new furnace, right? These are big ticket items that generally do, have, they wear out over time. There's no getting around it. You're going to have to replace them at some point. And these are things where you have maybe six, $8,000, um, you know, for a new furnace, 
uh, or maybe, you know, $20,000 for a roof, you don't want to be surprised by something like that. So you generally want to make sure that you're allocating enough money, setting that enough money aside for capital expenditures. So let's say, and you know, again, back in the napkin math, we'll say it's $115. Okay. So that makes, means that you've got a net income of $60 a month after all of your expenses and your allocations for capital expen expenditures. Um, that's basically it. Now that, that seems like it's a pretty lean amount. Um, maybe, you know, you, you have bought this property, f uh, fully, maybe it's under leased, maybe it's, um, there's not a lot of rents coming in or whatever, but I don't want to get into that right now. I just want to make sure that you understand the basics of the money that's coming in and the money that's going out and what's left over is also called the net income. Now, let's just say for argument's sake that we're going to bump up our capital expenditures to say $200 that brackets, anytime you have a bracket around a number, that would mean it's a negative number and that would be a loss. So um, from an accounting perspective, that's what that would mean. So we'll move this back to 115. And there you go. So that's the basics, right? I told you it wasn't all, all that uh, all that complex. <laughs> it really wasn't all that difficult. For those of you who are members, you can go into the site and just click this as a download. If you, get, if you overwrite the formulas, you can re-download it and reuse it, but you can add in categories that make sense for you. And even if you're ad adjusting and trying to figure this out for cash flow calculations based on your... Um, um, your expected revenues and expenses for a property that you're looking to buy. This is this is where it all starts, and it all starts with cash flow. So in this particular case, we're positively cash flowing this property at 60 bucks a month. Not great, but you know, hey, <laughs> it's at least a, a positive in, the, in in that column, and uh, seems like we're doing okay with this particular property. My name is Mark Dolphini, Landlord Coach. If you've got any questions, reach out to me on Facebook or uh, you can make a comment down here on YouTube. Um, but of course, if you've got any other questions, reach out. Uh, you, you can always drop me an email at mark at landlordcoach.com. And again, if for those of you who are members, you can always ask and submit questions on the Ask Coach Hey Coach session, and I'll be happy to answer them for you. Remember to always place a value on your free time because if you don't, someone else will. Have a great rest of your day.